The diorama that I make in this video could be worth $600. Hi, I'm Katie, and welcome back to Nerdic Inspiration. If you're new to the channel, my content is focused on tabletop-related crafts and nerd culture-themed art projects. With Broken Anvil's latest release of Alphok and Ratman models, they did a whole paint fight competition. And this competition is all about storytelling with their models in a diorama. I wanted to participate so bad. I knew I had to do something for this. Dioramas are just... Why I say that this diorama could be worth $600 is because the prize for this competition is a 3D printer resin as well as some of their own Broken Anvil uh, resin miniature kits. All these different prizes that they have offered for first, second, and third place. And so there's a potential that this diorama with everything that's going into it could end up being worth like $600. So a little bit about Broken Anvil. I'm not sponsored by them, but I do want to give them a quick shout out since their model is featured in this video. Broken Anvil is a miniature company that makes 3D printed STL files for you to purchase. They have a shop on my mini factory as well as a monthly Patreon that you can subscribe to. If you don't want to 3D print and you're not into that kind of thing, I am a licensed merchant for them and I actually sell their models in my shop, which you can check out in the link below. This competition is a diorama building battle, but it's mostly focused on storytelling. So you have to have a really compelling story behind your diorama scene, the theme, and the models that you choose. So the first requirement for this competition is that you have to include at least two models from their release that they just had, which is that Legend of Demore, Dumore, Daymore. How do I say it? <laughs> I've been calling it something different every time I say it. Everything that you put in the diorama has to be crafted by you. So even if you print some other objects that you want in the scene, they have to be, you know, printed and then cleaned and painted and everything by you. So it still counts if you 3D print objects that you want in your scene. Everything else, pretty much, you just have to make sure you're crafting it or that you're adding enough value to it that you made it your own. So I absolutely love this, like, owl woodcutter. He's like a little lumberjack. He's so cute. His pose is just like super relaxed. He looks so chill, but he has like a scar on his eye and there's so much about him that could really make for an awesome story. I also chose two of my favorite howler poses. One that is crouching down as if it's being kind of chased or jumped at, and the other one that is jumping up as if it's kind of like attacking the other one in a playful manner. This is a paint competition for a company that is selling these models, right? So I want the focus to be on the models more so than the scene. So the scene should just really support the story that I'm trying to tell and just pull everything together. So I tried two different options. I tried doing just like something, if it was like a rectangle and just one single plane and what that would look like. And I just sketched out high level where those models would sit and kind of the, the things that would be in that scene or what would surround those models. Then I did a second option where there would be an incline up into a hill that just felt too big. So I decided to keep it simple. One single plane, put a lot of thought into where I'm gonna place items like the rocks and the trees and just carve out a really dynamic scene in that one plane using the depth and placement of the models themselves. Spackle is a super cheap, lightweight alternative to getting any sort of plaster or sculpt -a mold And for this, I thought it was absolutely perfect. So I went ahead and with my spackle and spackled the entire thing so that I would have a nice sealed, complete diorama base texture. This is where I'll point out one mistake that I made, which was just me probably working on this at 6 a.m. before work and not thinking. I didn't color the spackle, so I just put white spackle on there, which is totally fine. There's no harm in doing that, but my life would have been so much easier if I just put some brown paint into the spackle, so that way it was already somewhat colored when I put it on, because the one downside to using spackle over other modeling compounds is it absorbs paint really, really fast, and it just took a little bit longer to paint over this stuff, and it just would have made more sense to to color the spackle. I didn't color the spackle. I would have colored the spackle. I should have, I don't know, I wasn't thinking. So color your spackle, just, it's easier, do that. This competition is technically like a month long, but I started this a little over halfway into it. I had a little bit less time to actually get this done, which is why my main thought was like, how can I maximize time 
as much as possible. So it was just kind of going between painting and doing things on the diorama itself and then going to a model and painting a model. So I kind of transitioned between the two. The first model that I painted was the woodcutter. I wanted to make sure that I had the most time spent on him so he could be perfect since he's gonna be in the foreground and the main character. So I played around a little bit with his color scheme. I knew I wanted his feathers to be gray because the gray would help him pop and really stick out in that foreground above all of the other elements. Considering there's gonna be a lot of earth tones in the background, I didn't want to make him brown and then he would kind of blend in with the browns in the ground and the trees and all that stuff. I really liked deep reds, kind of feel like that lumberjacky feel. I was trying to be experimental, but also cognizant of the fact that I had a timeline and a bunch of other stuff that needed to be painted. I'm really proud of the one eye that I did on him because it's absolutely perfect. It's piercing, it's terrifying, but it's cute. Like he still looks adorable. And that is the exact personality that I wanted to give this model was make him look super intimidating, but relaxed and warm and welcoming. Like he would give you a big hug, but he also could like murder you. That's what I wanted. When painting the Howlers, I went through the same thought process. I was thinking, how are they gonna fit into the scene? What colors am I gonna pick so they don't blend in? But I also don't want them to pop out so much that they're drawing attention away from the woodcutter. Cause even though they're important, I want your eye to go to him first. As far as theming, I wanted this to feel very warm. Like it was a sunny day, like it's relaxed and the scene is relaxed, like it's calm. So that's where I decided to go with kind of like a copper and red scheme and then highlight it even with a bunch of vibrant pinks. I don't know if you can also tell, but one of their beaks, I snipped off not realizing that it wasn't a support for whatever reason. And then I saw, wow, this one has literally no beak on its face. Something is wrong here. And it was just me, everything printed fine. I just was a freaking idiot and literally clipped off a piece of the model. I ended up going in with green stuff and sculpting a new beak for this one. Can't really tell. I don't know if you could tell, but now you're gonna look out for it. So I probably shouldn't have told you that, but we fixed it, everything's fine. The other thing that I had to do was paint up these train pieces. I ended up finding a big log that was on these kind of like stools and it was meant for a carpenter type of model. So I thought that was absolutely perfect as well as these little crates from the Broken Anvil release. And I used those to insinuate that this was like a little workstation. I took a bunch of these craft paints and just really layered on the different colors to create some variety. I'm seeing this as like a path maybe off of a cabin that he lives at. A great way to save time was to purchase pre-made miniature trees. Now these trees are terrible, but the good thing about them is that they already have a trunk base and they already have kind of piping to build on top of. You can use wire armature or tree building kits that have like tree armature sculpts in them that you can build on top of, but those are still gonna take quite a bit of time. For this diorama, I didn't necessarily want like a unique tree. I just wanted a ton of trees to make it look like a full wooded area. So I used these cheap trees that I then painted the trunks of to create some actual texture and variety in the trunks so they didn't just look like a hunk of ugly brown plastic. And then I also took my own basing materials and plugged tufts into the trees themselves to build them up and create some variety in color and texture. I also took some craft paint and mixed a couple different tones that went with the other tones that I had in the model. And I ended up dabbing that paint around the tree as well to create some unity between the color scheme that I was using and the actual basic materials.
And there we go, an owl diorama. Guys, can I get a hoot hoot? Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. You found it entertaining. You maybe learned something or a technique or a new material that you can try. If anything, I hope you enjoyed. If you did enjoy the video, give it a like and share it with your friends. Subscribe to the channel if you wanna see more content like this in the future. And if you wanna keep up with me outside of YouTube, follow me on Instagram. All my links are in the description below if you wanna check anything out. If you are a patron, then you saw a bunch of raw vlog content going into this diorama. I think I posted three vlogs related to this diorama in the past two weeks. So if you are wanting to become a patron in the future, that's the type of content that you can look forward to.